It all starts when a group of children go on a roller coaster ride at the fairground. The ride turns into reality when the carriage goes careering off the rails and the children find themselves in a strange and mystical land. They are about to become one dragon's dinner when suddenly a small white-haired man dressed in long robes appears. He introduces himself as Dungeon Master. He speaks in an old-fashioned sort of way, using words and phrases they don't understand. He gives each of them a magical weapon and a special identity. To Presto, he gives a magic cap, and he calls him Magician. He makes Hank a ranger, giving him a powerful bow and arrow. Eric is made a cavalier, and he is given a strong shield. Diana is to be an acrobat. She is given a magical javelin. Sheila is to play the role of thief. The dungeon master gives her a special cloak, which, when wrapped around her body, makes her invisible. And finally, Bobby, the youngest, is to be a barbarian. He is given a large club, which is almost as big as himself. Dungeon Master tells them that he is to be their guide. He warns them to beware a Venger, an evil and sinister being. Then, all at once, they look around, and he is gone. A small unicorn that they name Uni befriends them, and together they travel through this frightening world, meeting monsters, villains, and friends in their desperate search for a way home. Circus of Monsters. The children, still looking for a way home, came across a busy market town. There was a great crowd of people gathered in the market square. In the midst of the crowd was the cause of all the excitement. A winged horse. It was truly a majestic creature. It had the body of a horse with a thick chestnut-colored coat and the feathery wings of a gigantic bird. Oh, isn't it gorgeous, said Diana. But what is it? asked Bobby. I think it's called a pegasus, replied Hank. Come on, let's get a closer look. They pushed their way through the excited mob. Only five gold pieces a ride! shouted a rough-looking man. Only five gold pieces for the most memorable experience of a lifetime. Come on then, ladies and gentlemen, who's next? He said. Oh, but look at the poor beast, said Diana. He looks exhausted, and he's so thin. He looks very unhappy, said Bobby. Uni thought so too, and tried to say so. I think it's cruel, said Sheila. Can we go? I don't want to see any more. Fighting their way back through the crowd again, they came to a relatively quiet part of town. Bobby was the first to realize that Uni was missing. Where's Uni? he asked anxiously. Oh no, he must have got lost in the crowd, said Hank. We'll have to go back and look for him. And so, for the third time, they pushed themselves through the mob. But there was no sign of Uni. In desperation, they started to ask, Have you seen a unicorn? He's like a horse, but he has a horn on his head. And always the reply was, No. But then one old lady said, Yes, just a few minutes ago I saw one. What did you say it was called? A unicorn, said Bobby, his face brightening. Yes, it, it was a unicorn. That gentleman was walking it on a lead. I expect he was from the circus, she said. If it's strange animals you want to see, why not go to the performance tonight? She pointed to a poster that read, Maraz and his Circus of Monsters. Well, thank you. You've been very helpful, said Hank. But Uni isn't a monster, Bobby protested. Well, we know he isn't, Bobby. But it's worth a try, replied Sheila. Do you think he's been stolen? Said Bobby, swallowing his tears. I'm afraid that he may have been, said Sheila. That evening, they went to the performance. It was a strange spectacle indeed. There were lizard men, owl bears, white apes, living mummies, minotaurs, and werewolves performing in the most bizarre and cruel acts. Then, came the grand finale. 
And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to present the largest parade of performing monsters in the country, said Maraz with a wide sweep of the hand. And with this, the weirdest looking creatures walk slowly round the ring to riotous applause from the audience. Look, there's Uni, shouted Hank. The others stared in disbelief. He's in chains, cried Bobby. It was true. Uni was chained to the Pegasus walking in front of him. Don't worry, we'll get him back, said Sheila. They waited until the end of the show. Then they hid under a brightly painted wagon, and when everyone had gone home and the performers had retired for the evening, they made a search of the compound. Hey, over here, you guys, shouted Eric. Don't go away now, Uni. I'll get Sheila. We'll have you out of here in no time. Uni was locked up in a barred cage. There was no possibility of him going anywhere. Now, unfortunately, Eric had succeeded in alerting not only his friends, but Maraz as well. Sheila unlocked the cage, and Uni was freed, but at that precise moment, Maraz appeared with a bodyguard of owl bears. Well, who have we here? said Maraz. Quick, run, shouted Hank. Everyone, apart from Eric, managed to get away. Get your hairy hands off me, you freak, shouted Eric. The monster did not oblige, and to Eric's horror, he was thrown into a cage of ghouls and left there. The others, having run off in a state of panic, were now lost and didn't know which way to turn. Then a gypsy appeared at the door of one of the wagons. Come with me, my dears. I will hide you she said in a softly spoken voice. Could they trust her? Hank thought not, and he urged them on. Coming to the main tent, they hid underneath its heavy canvas. They could hear the sound of soft voices speaking quietly. It was a family of tiny winged people practicing their act. Maraz had introduced them earlier as the Sprites. Suddenly, Maraz came into the tent, and he started shouting at them. I was not happy with your performance tonight. You were not funny. Your jokes were old, and unless you can come up with some new material, you will be fed to the werewolves. With this, he stormed out again. Well, well, will he really feed us to the werewolves, Daddy? said a young sprite. No, he, he's just saying that to frighten us said the father sprite, although he knew only too well that Maraz had meant every word. I'm going to follow Maraz. You all stay here, said Sheila, and before they could stop her, she disappeared. I wish Eric were here, said Presto. He could tell him a few jokes. Let us go and talk to them. They may be able to tell us what's going on here, said Hank. Most extraordinary things were going on, as they were to find out. Maraz is a doppelganger, said the eldest sprite. A what? said Presto. The sprite explained. He is a shape-changing monster. He can change his shape to become anything he pleases. He could look like you if he wanted to. So we have to be very careful. We never know when he may be present, watching and listening. Meanwhile, Sheila had managed to catch up with Maraz. She followed him to the wagon where the gypsy had been only a few minutes before. He knocked and entered. Sheila only just managed to squeeze in invisibly behind him. The gypsy was staring into a crystal ball. Maraz spoke first. Well, what can you see? he asked. My crystal shows me many things, said the gypsy. Ah, never mind the patter. Just get on with it, said Maraz impatiently. The sprites have discovered your secret, and they have told those snooping children. Maraz looked angry. But what does the future hold? he asked. Ah, now this is good news, she began. You will have the largest collection of monsters in the world. You will be immensely rich, and your circus will become a legend. Maraz looked pleased with this. He thought for a while, and then said, now, for the present, first, I will have to dispose of those children. I have a plan.
plan. What? <laughs> he laughed menacingly. Then the skin on his face shrank back. His frame became smaller, and his features transformed themselves slowly and miraculously into the identical image of Eric. Sheila could hardly believe what she had witnessed. The others could hardly believe what they had heard. Hank was getting anxious. Sheila has been gone for over an hour now, he said. She may be in trouble. Presto, you stay here while we go and look for her. They didn't find Sheila, but they did find Eric, or so they thought. Hey, are you okay? Hank asked him. What happened? asked Diana. Hey, don't worry about me. I'm just fine, Eric replied. Have you seen Sheila? asked Hank. She followed Mara's, but she's been gone ages and we're worried about her. Sheila, who was equally worried about them, was standing behind Eric. But before she could warn them, and to everyone's horror, writhing and hissing snakes sprouted from Eric's head. He was the terrible Medusa spoken of in Greek mythology. The children stared, entranced by the sinuous movements of the serpents. The monster cast his eyes upon them all, and as they met his glance, they were turned to stone. Then the snakes shrank back. The monster became the familiar image of Maraz once more, and he looked well pleased. Sheila touched the cold stone statues that were once her friends. Suddenly she realized, but where's Presto? He's not here. She ran back to the tent and was delighted to find Presto there. She explained what had happened to the others and dragged Presto to the stone figures. A spell! You must think of a spell, said Sheila. But, you know, I, I'm not very good with these spells, Presto replied. It's their only chance. You must try, said Sheila. Well, here goes. Alka, Halsa, oh, magic cap, please give them bone in place of stone. The spell worked only too well. He had asked for bone, and there they were, skeletons. In one magical second, Hank, Diana, Bobby, and Uni were changed from statues to skeletons. Presto, what have you done to us? said Diana. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps I should have asked for flesh and bone, said Presto. Hold on, I'll, I'll give it another try. No, you won't. There's no time for that. We've got to find the real Eric and get out of here as soon as possible, said Sheila. The real Eric had tried several times to strike up a conversation with the ghouls, his fellow inmates, but on each occasion he had been met with a deathly silence. Soon, becoming tired of talking to himself, he had fallen asleep. Presto, Sheila, and the skeletons of Hank, Diana, Bobby, and Uni peered in. It does look like Eric, said Hank's skeleton. At that moment, a monkey in the next cage screamed out, and Eric woke up with a start to see the skeletons looking into the cage. He leapt back in horror and gave a helpless cry. That must be Eric, said Diana's skeleton. No guts. Sheila and Presto stepped forward. Are these friends of yours? said Eric, pointing to the skeletons. It's us, stupid, said Diana. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you. You've lost so much weight since I last saw you, said Eric. Okay, wise guy, shut up if you want to get out of here alive, said Sheila. Eric was anxious to be free, and he didn't say another word. to the sprites that we would go back for them, said Presto. The sprites were still working out some material for their act when Presto, Sheila, Eric, and the skeletons found them. At first, they were a little afraid of the skeletons, but Presto managed to convince them that they were friends. 
When he explained exactly how they came to be so, and how it was really his mistake, the sprites thought it was hilarious and couldn't stop laughing. But it was Eric who laughed the loudest when he heard the story of how Maraz had tricked them with his Eric disguise. Hank brought them all back to reality when he reminded them of the seriousness of the situation. I have an idea, he said. Remember the Pegasus we saw earlier today? Oh, yeah. It looks so unhappy, said Bobby. Uni said something which meant that he agreed, too. Well, we can ask it to give us a ride, said Hank. Oh, that's a great idea, Sheila replied. We can fly right out of this mess. You gotta be joking, said Eric. Well, I wish I was, but it's our only chance, returned Hank. But when they got to the cage where the Pegasus was kept, Hank wasn't sure this was a good idea after all. Maybe Eric was right. The animal looked so ill. It was thin and weak. Presto wanted to try his magic. No, don't, please, Presto. You don't know what may happen, pleaded Sheila. Yeah, look what happened to us, said Diana sarcastically. Let me talk to the horse, said the elder sprite. If you will just lift me up to him. Sheila lifted the tiny sprite up to the level of the horse's ear, and he explained their plan of escape. The sprite signaled that he wanted to be lowered. He's agreed to do it, said the sprite. It was a strange sight. Presto and Sheila were at the front, clutching onto the horse's mane, and behind them the skeletons of Uni, Bobby, Hank, and Diana were holding on to each other, and the sprites were holding on wherever they could. The creature lifted its enormous wings, and soon they were circling high above the tent. Maraz and the gypsy watched, dumbfounded. Then, in a last attempt to try and stop them, Maraz sent a pair of eagle-headed griffins in pursuit. But by this time, the Pegasus was far out of sight. Bobby looked down from a dizzying height to the changing landscape below. I wish we were going home, he said. He had voiced everyone's thoughts. What I want to know is, who's paying for this ride, said Eric. The elder sprite signaled to the horse that they were to descend, and soon they came smoothly and swiftly to land in a small and picturesque valley. They all clambered off the horse's back and stretched their legs. Well, thanks for the ride, said Eric. The others patted him and expressed their thanks, too. Now... It is my turn to thank you, said the elder sprite, turning to the children. Without your help, we wouldn't be here. But we really must say goodbye now. There is a village not too far away where we have many friends. We will try to make a new start there. Will you take the horse with you? asked Bobby. No, he's a wild beast. I think we should give him back his freedom, don't you?" returned the elder sprite. Bobby agreed, but at the same time he was sad to see him go. Then the children waved goodbye to the family of sprites. Well, where do we go from here? said Hank thoughtfully. I am not going anywhere looking like this, Diana protested. The others laughed. She's right, said Sheila. She does look frightful. Now, how did that spell go? Said Presto, thinking aloud. Let me see. Alka Halsa. Oh, magic cap. Gruesome Goblins. Are you sure we haven't lost our way? said Diana crossly as she felt a sharp bramble cut into her face. Hank, who was leading, was hacking his way through the thick branches that lay twisted across the path. They went deeper into a dense forest of undergrowth. Then Eric, too, started to complain. But all at once they were stopped dead in their tracks. Ahead of them, through the trees, stood a group of goblins. Ten pair of eyes, glowing red in the dim light, stared at them. Two of the group, who were mounted on dire wolves, came forward. Hey, fancy meeting you here, 
said Eric. Shh, said Hank. The ugliest goblin, the chief, spoke. You, come here, he said, pointing to Eric. Are you the leader? Eh, you could say that said Eric, smiling and glancing round at the others for reassurance. He didn't get it. What are you doing here? The goblin chief asked. Well, uh, we're lost, said Eric casually. Do you know that you are trespassing? Returned the goblin chief. No, I mean, who wants to own this dump? Replied Eric undiplomatically. All the time, the red eyes were moving closer. As the leader, you will have to pay the penalty of trespassing, said the goblin chief. Who? <laughs> Me? said Eric, his voice faltering. There was no reply. Two of the goblins, who were armed with clubs, grabbed Eric, and the others, too, found themselves surrounded by the gruesome-looking goblins. The children were dragged into the darkest depths of the forest. They came to a place where a bed of thick mosses covered an outcrop of rock, and there sat the ugliest of the goblins, the king. They had thought the other goblins ugly, but compared to him, they were almost pretty. He had one red eye significantly larger than the other, a grotesquely fat nose, a lopsided mouth, and thick, pouting lips. Within this group, the ugliest goblins hold the highest rank. Eric was pushed to the ground in front of the Goblin King. A large net was dropped down onto the others by a number of brightly colored gecko lizards who were positioned in the trees above. Well, who have we here? said the Goblin King. He sounded terribly bored. You see, trespassers were brought before him almost every day, and he found the whole procedure very tiring. A bunch of humans, your ugliest found trespassing in the royal garden, replied the goblin chief. Well, uh, let's get this over with, said the king, yawning loudly. What have you to say? His red eyes were fixed upon Eric. The others in the net were hoping that Eric wouldn't say anything stupid, but their worst fears were realized. Your hideousness, let me give you a word of advice. If that is the royal garden, then I should find yourself a new gardener, Eric replied. The king stared blankly at him. At first it seemed that he had ignored this insult, but then he said, oh, Let me see now. What will be an appropriate punishment for one who thinks he is so clever? He thought for a while and then said lazily, O T T F F S S. What comes next? If you could give me the correct answer when you are brought before me again tomorrow, you and your followers can go free. He yawned again. But if not, you will die a slow death. Your followers will watch, and they too will meet a similar fate. <laughs> For once, Eric couldn't think of anything to say. Now, take them away, ordered the Goblin King. Already they've wasted too much of my time. Eric, still on his knees, was dragged over to a wooden animal trap and shoved inside. The net containing the others was hauled into a shallow hole in the ground, across the top of the hole. A grid of interwoven branches was fixed. Five goblins, all heavily armed, guarded the captives in the pit, and another two guarded Eric. Have you ever had the feeling that you've been somewhere before, said Diana? She was referring, of course, to that evil-smelling pit in Castle Regalin. The others laughed. Eric shouted across to them, It seems that I have been given the guest room. His friends in the pit that chose to ignore this smug remark. I hope you can remember what the king said, shouted Hank. Ah, oh, don't worry, I've worked out the riddle already, replied Eric. Well, what's the answer then, shouted Presto, who had been trying to work it out himself for the past five minutes. It's O, oh, of course, said Eric, because it completes the pattern. O, T, T, F, 
F S S O. Then we go back again to the first O. The others thought about it, but they were not convinced. Then we have double O, double T, double F, and so on, said Sheila. Well, he could be right, I suppose. He had better be right, said Hank. Darkness fell quickly, and suddenly the forest was alive with giant bats, beetles, centipedes, and owls. Can't you get us out of here, Sheila? asked Bobby. We are too closely guarded, Bobby, explained Sheila, and we would never find our way back through these woods in darkness. Try to get some sleep now. He did try to sleep. He tossed and turned, but couldn't get comfortable. Eric, however, did manage to fall asleep, but he was woken up suddenly to see Dungeon Master in the cage beside him. Dungeon Master said, "Eric, am I glad to see you?" Dungeon Master replied, "I cannot get you out of here, but I can give you another clue, which will help you solve the king's riddle. Remember this rhyme: one for sorrow." Two for joy, three for girl, four for boy, five for silver, six for gold, seven for a secret never to be told. But before he had finished the rhyme, he disappeared. Eric wasn't sure that he hadn't been dreaming all this. Dungeon master saying nursery rhymes. He called to the others and told them what had happened. Eight a wish. Nine a kiss," said Bobby, continuing the rhyme. He blushed when he said "kiss." "I've got it," said Sheila. "Eight is next. Remember, Eric, the answer is E and not O." "But why?" Eric asked. "Never mind that now," replied Sheila impatiently. "Just remember, it's E." All too soon, the dawn broke and daylight came. Eric was dragged before the Goblin King again. Well, do you have the answer? Said the king. He sounded even wearier than he had done the day before. Yeah, I, I have. Said Eric nervously. The, the answer is E. Yeah, E comes next. But he was far from confident and didn't understand why the answer should be so. Oh, you are quite right. Said the Goblin King with a smile. Congratulations! The King was pleasantly surprised to hear the correct answer. After all, he didn't really think he could be bothered today with the awkward business of torture, a particularly slow torture. It took up so much of his time. The King was true to his word and eager to be rid of them. The captives were freed and escorted back through the woods to common land. Eric was acting very much the hero. But I still don't understand, Eric," said Bobby. "Why was the answer E?" "Oh, Sheila can explain better than I can," Bobby replied. Eric, O T T F F S S E, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight," explained Sheila. "Oh yeah." I understand now," replied Bobby, and now Eric understood too.